today uh, we have a rather difficult uh, topic uh, uh, we are going we should talk about electronic oscillators all our circuits need clock frequencies need carrier frequencies and we always assume that our oscillators are perfect and most textbooks uh, at least textbooks about electronics will do exactly the same uh, thinks this assumption is not true an electronic oscillator actually is a circuit that has some limitations so what we frequently assume is that uh, the spectrum of our signal source of the oscillator that may have an electrical supply or a mechanical supply in the case of a power station uh, supply of energy produces an ideal spectrum at the output uh, a sine wave signal that has only one spectral line and this spectral line is actually a Dirac delta function in the spectrum you can see spectrum this is not actually the case uh, every real world sources have a finite spectral line width and this is not e equal to zero this has some finite bandwidth and uh, this signal has sidebands on both sides that are uh, or the whole signal not just the sidebands the whole signal is uh, really uh, a noisy signal so all this spectrum down here under the curve under the uh, spectrum curve of an oscillator it's actually noise there is no uh, carrier no delta function at the carrier but there is just a, a discrete uh, the finite line width spectrum that has a finite line width uh, line width and we have to decide how further down we are here from the peak value what where do we consider when do we measure the line width uh, in uh, electronics oscillators have very narrow line widths line widths are several order uh, narrow several orders of magnitudes narrower than the central frequency and uh, for many many years textbooks uh, on electronics considered line widths to be infinite uh, line widths in electronics infinitely infinitely thin uh, this lines to be infinitely thin to have an uh, so that this assumption with a delta function was valid and most textbooks are written this way while uh, something different was in optics in optics uh, all optical engineers always talk about the line width of their light emitting diode or of their laser so uh, the line width is something uh, very common to deal with in optics so optical engineers will be quite familiar with this plot but electronic engineers and electrical engineers usually are not familiar with such plots uh, that's what we have to talk today we have to analyze the circuit of an oscillator how does it work how does it produce this particular spectrum red here is real blue is ideal but uh, we cannot never reach ideal we will try to calculate all the all the important parameters of the spectrum of an oscillator of course uh, we are going also to discuss the design of an oscillator uh, because uh, there are mathematical limits of what we can do with particular components we have for the oscillator but uh, doing things wrong we can do much worse much much considerably worse than the theory so we can only spoil the performance of the oscillator we cannot actually improve well central seldom improve or make v make very small improvements uh, to the initial initial result of an oscillator that's already good uh, so let's see on the next uh, picture how does an electronic oscillator work not a mechanical one a mechanical one that converts mechanical rotation into a sine wave electrical signal but an electrical oscillator that uh, operates off a dc power supply so all uh, radio frequency technology 
uh, started the, the most important breakthrough was the uh, vacuum tube, the triode vacuum tube invented in 1907 by Lee de Forest and this tube allowed amplification, electronic amplification uh, an electronic amplifier is nowadays a very important component but the real breakthrough was to make this amplifier make a signal uh, a generator out of this amplifier by providing feedback from the output to the, to the input and this was done a few years later 1912 uh, by both uh, Alexander Meissner and Edwin Armstrong Edwin Armstrong in the United States Meissner in Europe uh, both applied for their patents almost at the same time and uh, they had slightly different circuits both have fe had inductive coupling uh, feedback from the output inductor to the input inductor but uh, Armstrong used a tuned circuit with a capacitor on the input of the amplifier Meissner used a tuned circuit with a capacitor on the output of the amplifier so the patents are actually different uh, the oscillator evolved to other configurations so the Hartley oscillator can work without magnetic coupling uh, by providing electrical coupling with the, the correct phase with the, here with the capacitor from the output to the input now the two inductors actually behave as a single inductor with a tap in the center to invert the phase so both inductors uh, uh, together with the capacitor form a tuned circuit and this tuned circuit is actually responsible for inverting the phase from the output to the input while uh, for Armstrong and Meissner oscillators uh, we selected the correct phase by selecting the the sense of the winding of the two coils here I will use mutual inductivity between the output and input coil and we have to arrange the sense of the winding of these coils in such a way to get positive reaction from the output to the input very similar to Hartley uh, is Colpitz. Colpitz a few years later made a very similar oscillator uh, where he just replay, uh, exchanged the role of capacitors and inductors so here we again we have a tuned circuit with a tap but this tap is now no longer an inductive tap here but a capacitive capacitive tap but the principle of operation this time this tuned circuit is actually responsible for inverting the phase of the output to the input because the triode vacuum tube is always an inverting amplifier in it, uh, its configuration with the maximum gain and uh, vacuum tubes from 1907 have had very little available gain even before Colpitz there were people that made even other ex experiments and uh, one uh, experiment very f important for us is the hood kin oscillator from 1917 why is this important? hood kin actually patented uh, kin, uh, Ludwig kin actually patented this oscillator uh, with two tuned circuits at the output C2L2 and then the input C1L1 without this C3 this capacitor he just used the inter-electrode capacitor uh, capacitance of his triode vacuum tube to get this feedback through this capacitor so um, the uh, Hoodkin oscillator is actually a modification of the Hartley oscillator when we have, where we have uh, a different distribution of capacitors we have a smaller capacitor up here and we add missing capacitance here and here but again the two, these two circuits work as inductors in a Hartley style capacitor why is the Hoodkin uh, oscillator important no, right, uh, right now? Uh, today we are no longer building on purpose Hoodkin oscillators uh, they are very complex they need complex tuning of, bo of both tuning circuits tuned circuits at approximately the same frequency in order to start operating but uh, our real problem today is that we usually get Hoodkin oscillators in our circuits that are not supposed to oscillate so the Hoodkin oscillator uh, nowadays 
nowadays is actually not a feature but a problem of our circuits. It's a problem of instability of amplifiers. We want to amplify some signal with this amplifier, but this amplifier has built in a capacitance from the output to the input. This is usually the Miller capacitance in an amplifier. And this capacitance is actually making our circuit oscillate, though we do not, do not want oscillation. Uh, but uh, an amplifier is usually inserted in between two filters, a bandpass filter at the input, a bandpass filter at the output, and together with the Miller capacitance, this circuit may start oscillating. And this oscillation is usually un very, very undesired. Is very undesired oscillation, and we have stability problems today because of the Hutkin oscillator. So the Hutkin oscillator is uh, is not being used actually today. is not being made on purpose, but is really a headache of all our amplifier radio frequency amplifiers. Uh, we did not investigate with this short course on communication electronics. We do do, do not have the time to further investigate on the stability of amplifiers and how to make our amplifiers stable. We don't have the time to do that. So uh, regardless of the oscillator circuits, all oscillators actually operate at the same in the same way. We have to provide feedback from the output to the input with the correct phase and with some gain greater than unity. Let's see how this works out. And uh, the important uh, criterion for us is the Barkhausen criterion from 1921 so almost one more than 100 years ago from now what does Barkhausen say the oscillator always uh, works when uh, the gain of the amplifier a here and the transfer function of the feedback the product of these two is exactly equal to one and the phase shift is exactly equal to a multiple of 2 pi where this multiple may be 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on an integer multiple of 2 pi phase shifts uh, the oscillator will actually run at the frequency not where the gain is the highest but at the frequency where the phase shift is the correct one this is what Barkhausen says so phase shift is most important to define the frequency of operation of our amplifier and uh, at this phase shift our bandpass filter has uh, a transfer function this transfer function introduces some group delay this group delay is uh, v very clearly linked to the quality of the quality of the tuned circuits here in the bandpass filter in the feedback bandpass filter this group delay actually defines the slope of the phase curve the steeper this slope of the phase curve the more stable the oscillator the steeper the curve uh, the larger the group delay the larger the group delay is the steeper is this derivative of phase shift over frequency and this is closely related to the quality of this tuned circuit so we should not forget about, about this so the better the oscillator we want to make the narrower the frequency spectrum we want to get out of an electrical oscillator electronic oscillator uh, the higher has to be the Q the group delay of the bandpass filter the higher has to be the Q of the tune circuits inside here not because of the amplitude response the amplitude response is not imp that much important but the phase response should should have exactly zero or multiple of 2 pi or multi integer multiple of 360 degrees that's the frequency where the amplifier is going to work uh, in order for the oscillator to start uh, we actually need some gain that is larger than unity here uh, that with saturation after oscillation starts uh, this gain will go exactly to unity the product of both gains will go exactly to unity and uh, we, we supplement the losses in the 
feedback network and losses of the signal we get at the output with the gain of the amplifier inside our circuit. So this is the principle of operation of our, our amplifier. We only said that this curve has to be the steepest possible. The steepest possible, the narrower the spectrum. But we will have to calculate this spectrum. What do we actually get out of an electronic oscillator? To understand how things work, we have to look first how do oscillations start in one oscillator. In any oscillator we have some kind of noise present in the circuit. If this is an electronic oscillator, uh, here we have uh, thermal noise in electronic oscillators. If this is a laser oscillator, and in, uh, we have uh, amplified spontaneous emission in an oscillator, that's again noise, and this noise is going to ge get amplified by the circuit, and our oscillations actually start out of noise. So we have to use a class A amplifier that provides gain already with no input signal and provides at the same time provides noise to start the oscillation. This drawing here is actually not very accurate. This, uh, uh, this start up of the oscillator is actually an exponential growing of the sine wave produced by the oscillator. And after the oscillation reaches the maximum amplitude allowed by our amplifier, this amplifier has saturation somewhere, the gain, uh, the, the higher the signals we ga have in our circuit, uh, the, the higher, the higher, um, so in our circuit, uh, the higher the gain we have, the faster will be this oscillation start up and the uh, saturation of the amplifier which actually limit the final amplitude we can reach with our oscillator. So the linear gain should be slightly more than one to have this increase in the signal amplitude. Uh, slightly more than gain and then when uh, saturation takes over this gain is decreasing. It's decreasing to exactly one. So the feedback after oscillation has started, uh, the feedback uh, has exactly unity gain as dictated by the Barkhausen criteria. Uh, what is not uh, depicted on this picture here, this is an oscillator that has feedback just on one single frequency, but this feedback may be on many different frequencies including DC. So our oscillator may actually start oscillating at different frequencies pro uh, that uh, that uh, support the Barkhausen criterion, including DC. It may be also a flip-flop that only has two stable DC states. So that is also possible in amplifiers and where we have to be careful while designing amplifiers how to design these things. So our operation here is now, we start from thermal noise in the amplifier, this thermal noise grows due to the positive feedback, grows up to saturation. In steady state oscillation, we actually meet the Barkhausen criterion exactly. And there is some time needed for this oscillation start up. This start time, so uh, this start up should be here. Uh, this, st this start up time, this start up here, uh, ring in time here, uh, is actually proportional to the loaded Q of the oscillator of the tuned circuit and inversionally proportional to the frequency. There is also a multiplica multiplicative constant alpha. This alpha depends on the excess gain of our amplifier. Usually alpha is between 3 and 30. So if we take an example, a typical example of the circuits we have, we have a quartz oscillator driving a microprocessor. The quartz is designed for a frequency of 10 megahertz. It has a loaded Q in this circuit of 10 to the fourth power of 10,000. So this actually already gives us here one millisecond with an alpha of 10, the excess gain of the amplifier inside our microprocessor will give us a startup time of 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds 
uh, and this is now uh, the critical parameter for us since as long as we do not have a steady state oscillation a stable clock to drive the circuit of our microprocessor the lo uh, state of the logic uh, uh, inside the microprocessor is undefined the logic in the microprocessor cannot work without a proper clock and we only obtain the proper clock after the oscillator start up so the reset time constant of this microprocessor should be given by an RC network and should be larger than the startup time of our oscillator. If our microprocessor is using an RC oscillator, the startup time may be much, much quicker. But we usually use a quartz crystal to have a stable clock of our microprocessor and uh, this startup time actually defines, defines uh, uh, defines uh, this startup time actually defines our uh, our uh, time constant of the reset circuitry of our microprocessor. Uh, this is important when defining such uh, when designing such simple circuits like the clock of a microprocessor. Usually, people even don't think about the requirements of the clock because everything is given in the data sheet of the manufacturer of the microprocessor but there are some things some physical constraints that have to be understood and one of those constraints is our oscillator start up in the microprocessor uh, one particular application of this start up effect is the super regenerative receiver we already mentioned the super regenerative receiver while dealing with radio receivers so here uh, our start signal is not the noise but it's uh, a radio frequency signal incoming from the antenna uh, the amplifier of the RF oscillator uh, this may be a negative resistance amplifier that compensates for the loss in the tuned circuit here actually makes this signal grow the oscillator runs in here and we have signal gain and uh, finally we get into saturation we no longer have any gain when this ampli uh, this negative resistance oscillator gets into saturation so we have to turn off the oscillator turn off and we observe this ring out but this ring out still is useless for us for us the useful portion of this graph is only from here to here the gain process runs from here to here if with a detector we can detect the amplitude of this oscillation and we can uh, demodulate amplitude modulation and uh, feed it through a to a loudspeaker through a low pass filter a low pass filter to remove this quenching off and on of our oscillator this quenching frequency is around 100 kilohertz well above the uh, voice frequencies we are uh, listening here modulation frequencies and an audio amplifier to go directly to the loudspeaker uh, yes, uh, the super regenerative receiver may provide 100 dB of gain, provides an excellent AGC because this thing is exponential, but it has some other limitations. For us, it's important because this uh, super regenerative receiver is an immediate application of the oscillator startup. It uses this physical effect to pro to pro design directly our receiver. Uh, of course, since this uh, in during this start up, uh, this is actually amplified noise here, and the output of this oscillator is very noisy as long as we do not reach saturation. So uh, here we have a problem. Uh, the oscillator uh, used in a super regenerative receiver used in this way, quenching off and on and off, uh, is quenching off and on back on is actually a very noisy oscillator is not something provided providing the narrow frequency spectrum we would desire here uh, the desired very very narrow frequency spectrum this is not the case but it's important for us to understand that all these physical effects can be used in a rather simple circuits like uh, uh, super regenerative receiver now let's to try to go back to the steady state we want to analyze what is going here in the steady state where when we have exactly unity gain exactly exactly the correct phase shift in our oscillator and of course we have to uh, uh, analyze this uh, mathematically 
Before analyzing this mathematically, I have to discuss other oscillator designs. Uh, as I said, a super regenerative receiver has some tuned circuit in it, with some Q loaded. Can we do it without this Q loaded, maybe to speed up the start of our oscillator? Yes, uh, there are other possible solutions of making oscillators. Uh, it is possible to use uh, a class C amplifier, but a class C amplifier will not start out of random noise, because noise signals are much too small compared to the threshold of this transistor here. Threshold, if it's a bipolar transistor, is silicon transistor is 0 0.06, uh, 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 volts here. So, uh, in order to start class C oscillators, we need a start pulse. This is actually done in some switching power supplies. It is actually being used. There is a special circuit that provides a start pulse for the class C amplifier to start oscillating with suitable feedback and make some kind of uh, switching power supplies. This is used in switching power supplies, but uh, it is not, uh, it does not have very good performance. Uh, a transistor has a much larger, produces much much more noise in class C than in class A. So, uh, this is not a low noise amplifier. This is not a narrow spectrum amplifier. We can use as stable circuits in our amplifier, and this is frequently done in logic, like this circuit here. The Schmidt trigger inverter is used in some microprocessor, in some RC oscillators in microprocessors. We can do an RC oscillator using an operational amplifier where we provide positive fed feedback, to, uh, resistive positive feedback, feedback, and low pass negative feedback. And this circuit with hysteresis actually starts oscillating from zero. Uh, it's an unstable this, uh, circuit that starts oscillating immediately. immediately. Unfortunately, any circuit with high steresis is both slow in operation and very noisy. Slow and noisy and these things uh, do not help as much. So such kind of oscillators do not produce a very narrow spectrum. The spectrum produced by these oscillators is very broad. We can try to do something without using tuned circuits, without using with a high Q, using phase shifts. Uh, with a single transistor, we can build a phase shift oscillator where we have three RC cells, RC, RC cells, to obtain addition, an additional 180 degrees phase shifts besides the 180 degrees phase shift inside the transistor. This RC oscillator produces a nice sine wave on its output. We can do the same using uh, linear uh, inverters, logic inverters, used in their linear regime. So for this kind of circuits here, there is a saying that says any no odd number of gates, the number of gates has to be odd, always oscillates. And this is also a method to measure the performance of the inverters we manufactured in some technology of integrated circuits. So this is actually being used. It's also being used as a clock source for some microprocessor. These circuits actually contain class A amplifiers. Uh, they contain class A amplifiers and uh, they start from noise, noise from the transistor, noise from the logic gates. But the Q is very low. The loaded Q of such a feedback is in the range of one. Only if we had here a very large number of inverters, the Q's Q would grow because the Q with the increasing group delay, also the Q is growing here. So this is just for sake of, of completeness to show different oscillators designs, different oscillators here. Uh, they are done, they are used in our practical world, but they do not perform as good as the oscillator with the tuned circuits. So oscillators with tuned circuits produce a much better spectrum than oscillators with just RC feedback networks. So these oscillators are not that good and I'm no longer going to talk about them today. 
So just for sake of completeness, uh, well, some applications of oscillators, uh, this oscillator may produce a signal that is clean enough. For instance, in audio frequency, uh, the spectral line width of an oscillator is almost unimportant because even the frequency is very low. Uh, so the spectral line width is not that critical. It's not that critical in, a, in an oscillator circuit. It's not that critical in a clock source for a microprocessor. But it's very critical in other applications, and we shall see further on uh, where does this play a role. Actually, so we have different oscillator designs. Now, uh, all these designs that use class A, and these are class A oscillators that start from noise, the same as our RC, uh, LC oscillators here. LC oscillators are better, but uh, for all these oscillators, also for the phase shift oscillators, uh, the same theory applies. Also, it could be applied to the class C oscillator. Modeling noise in a, a hysteresis is much more difficult, so uh, it's, it's this, uh, the following discussion should be uh, should be uh, accordingly modified. So what is our discussion? We have an amplifier and a resonator. These two components are actually building up our oscillator with the feedback fed back to the input of the amplifier. Since we are talking about noise, we prefer to uh, reference noise at the uh, amplifier input because the noise figure of the amplifier is actually a reference to the amplifier input. The noise temperature of our amplifier for thermal noise, the noise temperature of thermal noise is also referenced to the input. So I'm trying to draw this picture with everything referenced to the input. If I try to model this noise, I just uh, uh, s uh, take an amplifier, uh, an ideal amplifier without noise, an ideal tuned circuit, an ideal resonator without noise, and I move all the noise sources from the amplifier and from the filter, bandpass filter, into an additional noise noise source, noise generator. This equivalent noise source replaces the noise from the tuned circuits and the noise of the amplifier. What is now the calculation? So the resonator is usually at room temperature. This does not need to be the case. There are more noisy resonators, for instance, using optoelectronic delay circuits, but that's, that's a talk for another lecture, not, not for this short course. So the resonator temperature is uh, actually equal to the room temperature, and the gain temperature is the temperature of the amplifier, always reference to the input, and the sum of both is simply the room temperature multiplied by the noise figure of the amplifier. In this way we simplify the discussion, so we have the resonator at room temperature and amplifier at room temperature. We can replace all these quantities with the noise figure of the amplifier. Hopefully the impedance is matched to the input impedance of the amplifier and to the output impedance of the output resistance of the amplifier. So now with this amplifier what is going on? When this thing is oscillating, this amplifier gets into saturation. So its uh, gain is changing, its gain is dropping to have uh, to satisfy the Barkhausen criterion. The Parkhausen criterion simply says that uh, this uh, product A times H of omega, that's the response of the amplifier, has to be equal to 1. This is what the Parkhausen criterion says at the oscillating frequency. Uh, if we calculate the transfer function of this circuit here, we have the this is a ratio of, of the input resistance of the amplifier in the uh, numerator and the sum of all resistances and reactive components in the denominator. The sum of all resistances is output resistance of the amplifier, losses in the tuned circuits and input resistors of the amplifier. And uh, A times omega should be now equal to 1. 
for the at the omega zero frequency and this is now in fact true if if i equal this a times omega equal to zero uh, uh, i obtain this expression only in this case i get zero because with my offset delta omega if i put an offset of delta omega equal uh, i try to simplify this expression here with the expression for a tuned circuits if i simplify this with delta omega and q loaded I obtain this expression at a delta omega equal to zero is a times o, a, a times h of omega is exactly equal to one at delta omega is equal to zero. As delta omega is growing from zero either positive or negative, uh, then this a times h of omega first it acquires a phase shift. And that's no longer useful for oscillation because Barkhausen does not allow any phase shift. And the amplitude of this expression decreases below 1. So the magnitude of this expression decreases below 1. So this is certainly correct what we got out of our explanation here. And uh, considering the Barkhausen criteria, the criterion that at the resonant frequency omega 0, where we are producing a steady output of u0, the the delta function in, in our spectrum uh, there uh, there we have this product is exactly equal to one with the correct phase shift for steady oscillation we need the Barkhausen criterion now how does noise travel through this circuit how does noise gets processed in this circuit we can try to calculate this noise voltage at the output is first the sum of the noise voltage at the input un un out is un plus the feedback signal the feedback signal goes through a goes through h of omega and gets finally summed to the output signal so this is the equation how the noise propagates this equation when is it valid this equation is valid only when this noise voltage is much smaller than the uh, amplitude of our desired sine wave output of this oscillator so we already made a simplification in our formulas uh, just to calculate noise far away from our desired carrier frequencies and this is what we actually need in a most times needed most times in electronics in electronics we consider on most occasions that our uh, oscillator is producing a delta function a, a very clean spectral line with s an infinitesimally clean spectral line with some weak si noise sidebands and the weak noise sidebands are here uh, we can now try to invert this revert this equation to express uh, we are here trying to invert this equation to express the output voltage just from the input noise voltage the output noise voltage just from the input voltage this happens with if I invert this equation revert this equation and now a time I insert in this equation a times h of omega under the assumption that the Barkhausen criterion holds if this assumption holds and if I calculate the feedback here I get uh, this expression for the output voltage it's a double fraction here but fortunately this double fraction can be simplified uh, this is relative it is relatively simple simple to simplify this double fraction to a single fraction here a single fraction so to simplify this search so, so we have the transfer function for the usually broadband thermal noise into the noise that sums to the output signal uh, we see here from this uh, equation here that uh, at uh, offsets different from zero and at high at high Q loaded this output voltage may be much lower output noise voltage may be much lower than the input voltage if uh, this is large and if this is large if both of them are large but uh, 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 so so if both of them are large but this equation does not hold 
at small offset at very small offset does not hold at small kilos it does not, also does not hold because it tends to infinity but that infinity is responsible for what that infinity is actually responsible for generating our feedback for generating the steady uh, steady output spectral line we will see more into detail next hour when we are going to deal with the spectral line width of a radio frequency oscillator. Usually we don't do this, uh, usually this is not described in textbooks, but I have to give you a complete physical explanation of what is actually uh, going on here. So we have to see where does this noise actually apply in the output signal. So we have this uh, expression here. Uh, there is very little contribution here. This is a contribution one of one uh, outside outside a certain bandwidth. We only see thermal noise at the output. Thermal noise uh, progressing through our amplifier. We only see thermal noise, but close to the carrier we get additional noise here. We don't get additional noise because uh, we at close spacing here, uh, this uh, denominator becomes small. Small denominator means a large output. Finally, culminating in the carrier frequency exactly when delta omega becomes zero, but at delta omega becomes zero, this equation is no longer valid. We know that. Now, uh, dealing with noise, it's much easier to deal with powers rather than voltages because voltages also include phase, and with cannot define the phase of a noisy signal but we can define the average power of the noisy signal uh, so we have to calculate the magnitude of this expression here written in this form uh, and uh, uh, taking now the, since power is proportional to the square of the voltage and uh, trying to calculate this uh, uh, 1 squared is equal to 1 but uh, this is uh, this uh, fraction here is completely imaginary so we just consider it b and b t we take b squares in calculating the magnitude so we have a simple expression to uh, calculate the output noise power from the input noise power also something is convenient to do is going f from uh, uh, from omega that's given in radians per second uh, from angular frequencies to go step from angular frequencies to conventional frequencies we just cancel 2 pi both in the numerator and the denominator of our fraction but it's much easier to work with regular frequencies rather than uh, angular frequencies it's exactly the fraction is the same but now this noise power at the output is the total noise power and this total noise power includes both amplitude noise power and phase noise power as long as we are dealing at a signal uh, as we are talking at a single frequency and we know the noise spectrum at a single frequency we cannot separate amplitude noise from phase noise we can only separate amplitude noise from phase noise when we know both sidebands and both sidebands actually sum up in the amplitude noise and subtract in the phase noise. What happens in our amplifier? Our amplifier operates in saturation. The amplifier in an oscillator operates in saturation. So uh, the amplitude noise is removed by the limiting effect in this amplifier. Uh, the phase noise is something we are left with. And this phase noise is actually the talk, uh, our today's talk. Uh, this phase noise that people did not consider in electronics for many years, but in uh, nowadays electronics, the phase noise is a huge problem. In most circuits, the phase noise is a huge problem. In most real, com real world communication electronics, phase noise is today a limiting factor. So uh, we shall calculate this phase noise and phase noise is identical to amplitude noise but this will be removed by the limiting amplifier is half of the output noise power because half of the output noise power goes into amplitude noise we have the expression here Now on the next picture we have to see 
uh, how to combine all these formulas together. We have to take the noise temperature here, how to build in this noise source into our amplifier and how this noise is transformed into the output noise. So an phase noise has a continuous spectrum, has no discrete lines, has continuous spectrum. So it uh, makes sense to use the relative phase noise, they talk about the relative phase noise density, not the noise power but the relative noise density and the relative noise density is, is noise power, uh, the derivative of noise power over frequency. This is usually called N0, we have already used these terms while talking about noise, the noise spectral density, uh, phase noise spectral density in our case, noise spectral density in our case. This is just the Boltzmann constant times the zero times noise, times noise figure. We already considered that. Uh, we, uh, we build this as our noise source, KBT0F, this is now PN pn per unit of frequency per unit of frequency because uh, we this uh, we normalize we uh, calculated just the relative uh, the phase noise density is here d phase noise over df and the relative because we relate it to the carrier power p0 carrier power p0 and this is now a quantity we can calculate out why we did it this way because in this way this L of F does not change if we attenuate or amplify the output signal of our amplifier. If we attenuate or amplify this signal, the relative phase noise density does not change. So this is a stable quantity describing the performance of our oscillator. If we plug in all quantities, we have then this one half for removing amplitude noise in the limiting action of the amplifier. We have this transfer function of our circuit for the noise power. We have the noise spectral density here. This should be further multiplied by the bandwidth to get the noise power over the carrier power. So this is relative noise density. David Leeson was the first one to develop this equation mathematically. What we did here this was this is Leeson's derivation uh, back in 1966 so considering electronics most invention in electronics date back to Armstrong date back to the first half of the 20th century phase noise was only found out uh, to be a problem first they, they did know did, uh, people even didn't know how to describe this noise Leeson was the first to develop the equation to describe it and also in the tw only in the 21st century we get to the point when where this parameter becomes really critical here this phase noise becomes really critical it depends on what if it depends on the resonator loaded q on the boltzmann constant on the circuit temperature on the amplifier noise figure and on the carrier power so the higher the power i have my oscillator is generated the less phase noise, relative phase noise density I get. This is an important consideration, so low power oscillators are not desired for the best noise performance. Higher power amplifiers are much better with respect to phase noise, uh, provided that this noise figure does not, uh, does not uh, increase with the output power. Frequently, this relative phase noise density is not given in linear units. Linear, linear units it is hertz to the minus one because of this directive, the, uh, the, the, this uh, derivation. While uh, powers actually can uh, the watts of the power actually cancel out here. Uh, we usually use logarithmic units in decibels uh, compared to the carrier. This is relative. dBc is carrier here over one hertz of bandwidth. If we, if we have DCB, dBc per hertz of bandwidth, we have to first multiply this relative phase noise density by one hertz. Then when we have, we removed any measurement units here, we can compute the logarithm here. And what we will see on Wikipedia and on other textbooks, 
in, in, in many textbooks, you will only see this final equation published, this final equation uh, that gives the result in decibels, uh, 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 decibels uh, below carrier in hertz, uh, in one hertz bandwidth. What many people forget is this one hertz here. If I don't have this one hertz uh, actually present here, I cannot compute this logarithm. But many people write the equation with the wow without this one hertz here, so they ha they do have this problem. How does the solution of the, this equation look like? At large offsets, I only have thermal noise uh, being generated in, in all known circuits, in oscillators, in amplifiers, in attenuators, all of them generate thermal noise. But at close offsets, the phase noise is growing proportional to the inverse of the square of the frequency. And this phase noise is only generated in the oscillator. Amplifiers do not generate uh, this kind of phase noise. Uh, this kind of noise. Uh, also, uh, 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 attenuators do not add phase noise to the signal. They only add thermal noise. So this is a property of the oscillator. When dealing with the phase noise of an oscillator, we frequently use the simplified Leeson's equation when we neglect this one. This one here is actually the flat curve for the thermal noise. We are only interested in this region and simplifying the equation is the region we frequently use the simplified Leeson's equation. Uh, I'm writing all this equation in linear units because it's difficult to talk in decibels here. Though people frequently take, take the logarithm and compute decibels, in theoretical discussions, we prefer to use linear units here. That's the reason I why stick with I stick with linear units here, as we have. And now uh, on the next figure, we should see why is this phase noise that important? What consequences does the phase noise actually generate? In uh, numerical communications, in digital communications, phase noise actually rotates our constellation randomly. So this symbol may rotate, this symbol may rotate, this symbol may rotate, this symbol may rotate. If they rotate too much, I get errors in the transmission. So it's important to know what the, what the mean deviation of the phase of the signal is. Because from this mean deviation, I can calculate then the symbol error rate in uh, numerical communications. This, in this case, I actually have to sum. This is noise power. I have to sum this no power, uh, no, uh, with this uh, 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 phase noise power. I have to sum this phase noise power over a certain frequency range. Uh, and when I have summed, I have to consider both side bands. That's the reason of this two here. And I have to take the square root because this was power and this is uh, now amplitude. Normalized power, normalized amplitude. Where do I have to sum all these things? Uh, the maximum frequency is uh, the bandwidth of our modulation. Uh, this is given by the simple rate, R. And the minimum uh, frequency is actually the bandwidth of our carrier recovery circuit. The receiver needs a carrier recovery, and that carrier recovery has some finite bandwidth. Uh, so the carrier recovery has to compensate for any frequency errors of the transmitter and of the receiver. This is the far the most important effect in digital communications. In numerical communications, this thing actually limits the amount of phase modulation I can perform or the carrier frequency because the higher I go with the carrier frequency the larger the the rotation if the if the rotation is larger here than uh, pi over 8 I get bit errors uh, many years ago even before David Leeson uh, 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 developed his equation people noticed uh, residual frequency modulation on uh, analog frequency modulated links. 
the usual choice for voice links is to consider the spectrum from 50 Hz to 300 kHz. I have to in uh, sum here not not the phase uh, phase power but the deviation power. That's the reason why I have to multiply this by the deviation squared to get the deviation normalized deviation power. I have to integrate it over my frequency range of interest for voices from 50 Hz to 3 kHz, twice for two sidebands, for both sidebands, and taking the square root because this sigma f here, the residual frequency modulation, is actually given as an amplitude, not as a phase. It has units of frequency because I get the units of frequency in here. Uh, taking the square root of this delta f squares gives me hertz for the frequency. So here I had radians units for the uh, uh, deviation of the phase angle. For the deviation of frequency, have, I have hertz as units. Next, what uh, the phase noise does is generates interferences to other users. The worst interference I get in the adjacent channel, immediately adjacent channel, if I plot these noise sidebands, I get a substantial power of interference in here. And this, inter this interference is uh, directly going to disturb uh, other people, to disturb other users here. So I take my carrier power and multiply it by the, integ the integral of the relative phase noise over the given frequency range and I get then the noise power of the interference here since I am only looking at the interference of on one side of my spectrum I only take one side bend so there is no factor of two here finally what the consequences of phase noise are uh, we can even see consequences of the phase noise on clock jitter they do generate clock jitter and the clock jitter becomes uh, extremely nasty if we have many regenerators connected in series like SDH regenerators. Uh, Ethernet is much simpler to deal with uh, clock jitter than SDH but uh, these synchronous protocols are still being used nowadays and there are very strict uh, requirements for the clock jitter. This clock jitter is now given in timing units so I have to divide my deviation of angle with the angular frequency to get the timing timing error out here. And the timing error is plus minus this uh, timing deviation here. The maximum frequency is our clock frequency, what is the clock frequency defined, and the minimum frequency is actually the bandwidth of our clock recovery circuits. Even clocks cannot be cannot be uh, completely identical in the transmitter and the receiver, and I need some clock recovery, and this clock recovery has some bandwidth. This uh, clock recovery bandwidth is described very, very accurately in the specification of SDH regenerators. So this is something uh, SDH engineers, so synchronous communication engineers, know very well. So there are many cons practical phase noise consequences to be dealt with today. Uh, I'm stopping here with this lecture and with in, next, in the next lecture I'm going to see further details, we are going to see further details of the phase noise. But phase, phase noise today is really the limiting parameter for many equipment uh, we have, for many system designs. We cannot design certain systems because those systems uh, are way too much sensitive to phase noise in any of these four, four figures here. So phase noise is really generating lots of problems. We have to see further detail next hour.